If you're asking for my goals, you need a Kansas City Chiefs victory, and then you need Travis Kelsey to marry Taylor Swift in a you oh know in a in a royal and wedding. Model good he has to win first. They have to marry on the fifty yard line. <laughs> And I mean, oh that's, my God. it'll just all go your way, I'm Ross. I need you to get out of the house more, At Ross. At some right. point, it does. At some point, it has to start all going my way. From New York Times Opinion, I'm Carlos Lozada. I'm Michelle Cottle. I'm Ross Douthat. I'm Lydia Polgreen. And this is Matter of Opinion, where thoughts are allowed. <laughs> So our thoughts today will surround the Super Bowl. Super Bowl Sunday is upon us. Go team. And uh, we at Matter of Opinion are going to talk football, right? Nothing but football. I was mm. promised. Are we? Yeah. Not, are we? Not, not really. <laughs> no, no. We're so naive. <laughs> no, actually, we're going to try to t- understand the Super Bowl as a cultural event, as a as a collective cultural event. But I wanted to ask you guys. It's sort of the season for lots of these kinds of events. We just had the Grammys. Uh, We have the Oscars coming up next month. We have the Olympics in the summer. I've been thinking about what is the impact and the purpose of these kinds of events? What social and cultural function do they serve? Are they are they unifying or not, especially in America that, as everyone tells us, is is very divided? So I hope that's what we can kind of figure out. And maybe one way to do that is instead of looking forward is actually look back We've all experienced these kinds of events before. Is there one kind of very memorable moment in your life where you were part of some kind of mass cultural event ooh, ooh, that, yes. that you me, feel me, kind me. of marked you? Me. All right, Michelle, shoot. 1981, the wedding of Prince Charles and the oh. guy. Oh, it was yeah. not just me. 750 million people across 74 countries watched this bad boy. How old were you? 11? So I had to get, you know, they're five hours ahead of where I lived. I had to drag my butt up way too early to watch all the pre-gaming, the glass carriage. It was kind of glorious. Yeah, it's funny. You know, I, um, my moment is actually more recent. Um, and it is the finale of the first season of Survivor, a show that careful listeners of this show will yeah, know that I'm deep, com- <laughs> completely, completely obsessed with. So much about what our media landscape became and, you know, of course, the presidency itself with Donald Trump and so on, really kind of call back to that creation moment with Survivor and Survivor becoming this thing. It was a time when we all watched you know, shows the day that they came out on television. There was no YouTube. The recapping industry didn't really Mm. exist. You know, so it really was a kind of watch it live thing. And um, I think it was the last time that I remember having a sense of like, I cannot miss this. Like, I will Hmm. be a social outcast if I don't watch this and I'm not (laughs) able to talk about it tomorrow morning. And that was in 2000, I think. Um, Was that that long ago? Yeah. Oh, my God. I mean, I, I was trying to think of a good one with the Olympics, but really when, I, when I'm thinking about sort of collective events, I was just a huge baseball fan. And I was thinking about the playoffs and World Series after September 11th, right? And, mm. you know, in its own dark, horrifying way, 9-11 was itself a kind of collective, collective cultural event among many other things. But then there was this way in which that postseason because the Yankees were in it, and um, I was a Red Sox fan, so I hated the Yankees, but it was the only time sort of all of America was kind of rooting for the Yankees. To be clear, I was not, but <laughs> most of America... You aren't falling I for that. I wasn't falling for that. Stay true, I stayed true. Sort of true. I stayed true. I stayed true, but it was, like, it was sort of this rolling collective sports experience culminating as all great collective sports experiences should, and the Yankees ultimately losing. Ouch. Ross, I thought you were going to say um, George W. Bush throwing out that first pitch. Well, that, that was I, a I very, mean, that was, that was a wonderful that was, moment. That was in there, too. That was yeah. big. That was his yeah. whole re-election campaign. Mm. It, it, I mean, <laughs> yeah, really. Yes, it, yes, it, it, 9-11 well. was the entire re-election campaign. But it's interesting to see that your experiences, like all these experiences are things that are mediated for you through television, right? Like, I think definitely um, 9-11. I mean, we were all glued to the TV watching it happening. That was, you know, experiencing trauma together. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. And I think the fracturing of that experience is a big part of the story of what is uh, what has happened to us. Um, we are all, uh, you know, if not bowling alone, we're 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 all watching, <laughs> we're, you know, nice. we're all watching different channels and the sense that. 
were coming together around big events, uh, big cultural events that affect us as Americans, it does feel much more fragmented. And of course, that biggest event uh, coming this weekend is is the Super Bowl. I mean, it brings in more than 100 million viewers. Think about that. The only TV show finale, we talk about television a lot, you know, to do that ever was was MASH. Cheers didn't, mm. Seinfeld didn't. And those were like series finales, right? The Super Bowl is just a season finale. I mean, it's been going on for 58 seasons, right? Like, it's just <laughs> it's just one more. Um, so, you know, why, why do you think this event, this game, has so much resonance and staying power? So I think there's a couple of things. One, it's become a secular ritual, and people need ritual, and especially as we've become a, a less religious society with less connective ties and less common, you know, media ecosystem— there are different elements that have grown up to surround and elevate this like central piece. I think people love that. You know, you have the commercials, you have the halftime show, you have the parties with like the really bad wings and nachos, which are my favorite part of this whole thing. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, fact check. There's no such thing as a bad chicken wing. Oh, God, I kind of uh. disagree on that one. <laughs> so I just, you know, true confessions, I've never watched the Super Bowl. I actually wow. really, really, really have some deep moral qualms about football. No Beyonce halftime show? No, no, hold on, hold on. I'm coming no. to it. I'm coming to it. Okay. Like, I, I think that, like, it's, you know, sort of a modern-day gladiator sport where we, you know, tolerate the breaking of, of, of men's bodies in ways that are, you know, incredibly brutal and tragic. And I just, like, I don't know. I can't, I can't sign off on that. So, so what I do instead is uh, look at YouTube to see the halftime shows because they're just they're like really wonderful. And I think the most successful halftime shows um, do have this quality of just like sort of bringing people together. And so I was looking back at some of my favorites and, and I think one of the greatest of all time was when Prince plays yes. In the Rain. Yes. And of course, he sang Purple Rain in that moment. Of course there's, he did. there's a great mini documentary about that Super Bowl and that that halftime show where the producers of the show or whatever like reached out to him and they're like you know we're really sorry but the forecast is for pretty serious rain and prince just said can you make it rain harder <laughs> right like like because he, he obviously knew what a moment it was going to be right yeah. and yeah. that's why you know 17 years later people are still talking about that halftime show yeah well that and he was one of the coolest ever so i mean i think part of it part of the appeal of of the super bowl is just you know it's this kind of climax event of American culture, right? It's athletics and it's violence and it's commercialism and it's regional rivalries. And I mean, part of the appeal is precisely the fact that it's a gladiator sport. Like it's it's bread and circus, you know? I mean, you can have very like specific reasons why you're into it. Like I follow college football, especially Notre Dame. And so I look to see like which Notre Dame players are advancing in the playoffs. And so like the Kansas City linebacker, Drew Tranquil from Notre Dame is, you know, starting in the Super Bowl and Aaron Banks, the left guard for the Niners. So like I'm rooting for the two of them more than for more than for the teams, even though I I, I grew up a Niners fan. Um, so I think it sort of captures a lot of, you know, what we like and and maybe dislike about America all in all in one night. I mean, it is liturgical, like it, you know, huh. it just <laughs> is sort of quite, I mean, it's it is the Super Bowl is a liturgy. I mean, and I think people who are actually religious who also like the liturgies of sort of American pomp and power need to recognize that, you know, there there is something sort of slightly debasing about going all in for a sort of pure secular liturgy of American excess and, and so on. The only thing worse than having a somewhat debased secular patriotic liturgy is not having any yes, collective liturgy at all, at all right? Yeah, sure. Then you just kind of drift aimlessly, eternally one... in your separate directions. <laughs> well, from yeah. one YouTube clip to the other. So as assuming that you do watch this game on Sunday, Lydia, um, looking at you, and the rest, <laughs> what, like, why are you watching? What are you looking for specifically in this experience on Sunday? Well, I'm, I'm very interested in how we come to, like, hold the identities that we have. And my feeling is that a lot of the ways in which we hold the identities we have is just sort of constructed. You know, it's stuff that, you know, we get from various places and, you know, we, we put it together and, and, 
you know, usually it's good enough to make something that feels satisfying, and that's and that's great. Um, and being a fan of a sports team and like feeling like that's like really like a huge part of your identity and who you are is like a great example of that. And so I I sort of stand on the side and just be like, wow, it's kind of amazing that people have this level of devotion to players of this extremely hard to follow, slow moving, lots of stops <laughs> game. And like how nice for them. Because, you know, it's not easy to find a sense of belonging in this fractured and polarized world that we live in. Um, so if this works, that's totally great. I'm, I'm into it. Like better this than, say, QAnon. Those are our choices. So, Lydia, you think the Super Bowl transcends politics rather than is becoming just one more politicized event? I think historically it has. Um, You know, it's funny. I was also thinking about, like, what exactly is it about sports that illuminates something about the American character, right? And I think, like, the NFL is racially mixed. You know, it is an integrated institution uh, where people cheer for stars from from all races. Um, You know, there's the opportunity of being discovered for your raw talent. So I think it has these sort of mythic qualities um, that, that, that feed into the possibility of it being a place where this convening can happen. But I think those very same qualities also create the conditions under which people want to bring to the attention of this this kind of great public forum the issues that matter. And I think that's why we saw the taking a knee and, you know, people's anger at that. Um, So I actually think all these controversies about, quote unquote, politics at the Super Bowl or at at NFL games in general have actually been great for the sport because it it just underscores how important uh, this institution is in our culture. I think obviously football has, you know, interacted with the culture wars and, you know, the the entire Colin Kaepernick taking a knee debate was sort of itself clearly connected to larger debates about race and policing, wokeness, you name it, in American life. So it's not that it's not that sort of politics hasn't intruded. In many ways, I mean, you can see this just in the ratings. It it really is much more than the Oscars, which is seen as, I think, fundamentally left wing, just because Hollywood is quite left wing and any political statements are going to be left wing. I think, yeah, football is in a not apolitical, but sort of supra political category all its own, even now. I think maybe we gave too much attention, and I was guilty of this too, to the kind of right-wing, anti-Taylor Swift, Travis Kelsey stuff. Like, it's not clear to me that that was much more than a bunch of right-wing influencers asking for attention, which then... then we we obliged. They got. They got. <laughs> they got, right? So but needy. like, I mean, is, you know, the, I, I think the the potency of the Super Bowl is such that it is uncancelable by any faction, right-wing or left-wing. Huh. I, I think what keeps football going is that it is there's nothing else that's sort of a load-bearing point in our national culture so as sort of common culture recedes the things that remain take on more and more significance and in their own way become harder to get rid of i think the nfl is in a way its cultural position is much stronger today precisely because other forms of common (laughs) athletic experience have diminished That is a very good place for us to um, take a break. Let's call it halftime. And when we come back, we will talk about whether we need more mass Super Bowl style events and where we might find them. And we are back. So given all the sort of cultural and political divisions that we've hinted at, is the Super Bowl really the last example of a truly shared mass culture? You know, Ross suggested it's in this like unassailable position. Or are there other cultural institutions that have the power to sort of bring us together or at least draw our attention in a similar way? 
I don't see any. I mean, isn't that what makes everybody nervous? Kind of shared rituals and institutions are fading and have lost their pull, you know, whether you're talking about church or the Lions Club or even the nightly news, which, you know, used to have this unifying effect on what Americans viewed as kind of cultural events and that's fragmented into a million different pieces. So I think what we're looking more toward is kind of many mass cultural events. And by that, I mean things like a show that is popular with a certain segment of America. Mm. And so you're not approaching the 115 million necessarily, but you kind of look for your moments. And I think people definitely want that and crave that. I mean, just look how crazy the Barbenheimer movie phenomenon was last summer. And people loved what was essentially a manufactured marketing ploy because people were doing it together and they felt like a part of the thing and social media was posting about it and I got to buy my pink jumpsuit. I'm just saying. I need to see this pink jumpsuit, Michelle. I'll hook you up. So guys, I have a question like, what do you think is going to happen if it fades or if, like, what are we... What are we looking at here if we lose these things? See, I see. I don't think it's. I, I don't think in the near term it's going to fade. That was sort of the the point I was trying to make with the NFL. I think what has happened is that the dynamics of internet culture are not that the superstars disappear or the the shared events. It's that there's just going to be like instead of ten shared events, there's like one or two, but they're bigger than ever. Taylor Swift is a good example. I, Taylor Swift is bigger than any singer in my lifetime. I think she's bigger than Michael Jackson, maybe not bigger than the Beatles in the early 1960s, but she is huge. Like I, When I listen to the tween girls who I am exposed to <laughs> through being a father of <laughs> tween girls, like I remember my friends and it was like, you know, you would have five or 10 or 15 bands and singers you were into. And today it's really, it's one. It's it's just <laughs> Taylor Swift. Tay-tay. And I think, you know, even in politics, I think you can see the, you know, the Donald Trump phenomenon as in a weird way reflecting reflecting this. I sense. alone. The there I can, alone, be, there only can one. be only one 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 fan club. <laughs> um, and in cinema, like Tom Cruise is a bigger movie star today than arguably at any point in his career, certainly at any point since the 1980s. There aren't any other movie stars, but there is there is Tom Cruise. Um, so I, I think that is the weird dynamic, that there is a kind of superstar effect that creates a few really, really big winners. The NFL is the really, really big winner of sports. And what's vanished is this kind of, the sort of, middle-size shared events, middle-size artists, middle-size movie stars. All of that is what is diminished. It's all sort of microcultures and YouTube clips on the one hand, and then a few really big things that are right now, to me, feel too big to fail. I think Taylor Swift is too big to fail. I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the Super Bowl is one of those sort of winner-take-all, too-big-to-fail events. But that doesn't make it necessarily a good convener of mass consciousness in a way. Like Lydia mentioned um, Bowling Alone. That's the famous Robert Putnam essay from the 1990s, which later became a book, in which he argued that Americans were joining things less than they used to, not participating in in community. And his big example was the decline of bowling leagues. People were still bowling, but not together. They were bowling alone. And his concern is that that was a reflection of how we're no longer forming the ties that build community and that build networks. Last night in preparation for this conversation, I went back and read the original Bowling Alone essay from the Journal of Democracy, 1995. And one of the things that he focused on was what he called the the technological transformation of leisure. He was focused on TV at the time. TV, he said, is individualizing leisure time, inhibiting the formation of, of communities. He said, television has made our communities or what we experience as our communities wider but shallower. Right. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if the Super Bowl is that it is it is a a wide, wide, wide experience. But ultimately, it is a, a shallow one. And it is. And yes, we, we have Super Bowl parties, but we're not we're not experiencing the event together. It is always mediated by something else. Sure. But this is telling this is the you're giving us the 1990s critique of the shallowness of 1990s 
mass culture. And you could say a similar thing in books. You could be like, you know, we've gone from Book of the Month Club and people reading the classics to everybody reading Stephen King and so on. But then flash forward 20 years. I love Stephen King. Yeah, and, let's not talk smack. I, I'm not talking smack okay. about Stephen King. You implied smack, Ross. I, no, yeah. I'm, I, I, like, I like the Super Bowl. I am, a, I am an enjoyer of both the Super Bowl and Stephen King because I am a true American. <laughs> I'm just saying that in the 1990s, the Putnams of the world were like, oh, man, you know, television, pro sports, and pot-boiling bestsellers are no substitute for the old-fashioned form of community. And now we're sitting here in 2024 saying, man, it'll really be terrible when those pot when the Super Bowl goes away. When the Super Bowl goes away, <laughs> right? That, that's, it just reflects the change we've lived through where everything Putnam said was true, but it turns out that, you know, there are worse things than the superficiality of common <laughs> events back then. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that, I don't know, like nostalgia, it's a hell of a drug. But over the weekend, uh, I went to a theater to see The Wiz, uh, which is the, the, a, the original The Wiz, uh, Diana uh, Ross, Michael uh, Jackson. Uh, yes, yes. Wow. Uh, this was a this was a 1978 American musical. Um, and the reason that we went to see it was because um, for my wife, this was like a huge part of her childhood, this movie. Um, and she really loved it. And they had a VHS and her parents were really, really into musicals. Um, but it was a classic sort of event where it was considered a huge flop, right? But I think there were like two separate experiences. You know, Black families and my wife's working class Jewish family, for whatever reason, thought this was the most amazing thing. And like people went and saw it again and again and again in theaters. But it was in some ways kind of like a niche event. You know, like The Wiz was really big with a certain like population. Um, later, it becomes sort of a cult classic and, like, people love it and blah, blah, blah. So I think that this sort of splitting and fragmentation has been with us for a long time. It's just fascinating to me that, like, there are these particular cultural products or cultural moments that capture, like, the kind of, like, huge, 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 broad American attention. And then there are others that sort of, like, just sort of seem niche and only get one kind of corner of it. Well, yeah, I mean, you can talk a lot about the problems of television, but, you know, mass events in this country have revolved, as we've noted, around mass culture for a long time. I mean, you know, if you're talking about MASH with its 105 million people watching the series finale or a particular uh, miniseries or used to when everybody would have to sit down at the same time and watch The Wizard of Oz because it came on, what was it? It was like around some holiday or whatever. You just didn't have that many options. And there were these televised events that people had to do because they could not sit down with their phone or other device at a moment's notice and screen whatever they want. And it's just a further fragmentation. So, yes, every generation deals with its own media challenges, and we haven't figured out how to deal with it right now. But it is costing us a lot of connective tissue and a lot of kind of these moments. But sports is different because, like, it happens in time and, like, the result and outcome is something that is, like, only going to happen once, right? <laughs> like, it's, it's so it's, in some ways, it, it makes sense that this is the sort of last refuge. Yeah, it, it totally makes sense that that retains a unique kind of power. When some of my kids were younger, I remember putting on uh, maybe a baseball game or a football game, and they were sort of flummoxed that it was happening in real time. <laughs> you know, that, that like, because you're, I mean, part of it is when you're a kid now, it isn't even, you're never waiting till 8 p.m. for The Wizard of Oz to come on. You're, you're never, there's no waiting involved in the consumption of any popular culture in an age of streaming. You just assume everything is just sort of there to be watched at any moment. So the idea of a form of entertainment that yes, you can you know you can record it and watch it later, but it it has an actual place in the slipstream of time that you can only connect with at a particular moment, as opposed to it being either algorithmically or culturally um, sent to you. Like people who didn't watch the Grammys were like, "Oh my god, I heard that there were like these three amazing performances," and then they seek them out and they either heard because it got pushed to them algorithmically on social media. Guilty as charged. I absolutely did that. Or you know they heard from their friends or some combination of the both, and then it becomes sort of ubiquitous. But that's very different from like just having, which is the very throwback experience that I had, which was like. I'm going to sit down and I'm just going to watch the Grammys. And to me, it did feel like 
I was having a real authentic experience of something in real time that contained surprises. I had no idea yep. what to expect. I had no sense of like, and it was, I, I, let me just tell There's you. There's no Wikipedia was, summary. No, it was wonderful. <laughs> I mean, it was, I felt transported to a different time in my life. Like, Aww. I just, I cannot, I cannot recommend this experience highly enough. <laughs> Transcendent <laughs> Grammys. Yeah, it was great. You know, I, I didn't watch it. And I only saw clips later on. And when I saw Tracy Chapman and Luke Holmes do Fast Car, I loved it. But I really wished I had seen it as it was happening. Totally. But you know what? One thing I'm kind of stuck on that Michelle mentioned and all, all of you have, have discussed in some ways is, is whether sort of community is better when it's small than when it's big. You know, so like I've seen Oppenheimer twice. Once was in the theater. Tons of people, huge crowd. No community. Mm. I saw it a second time a few days ago with my wife and two friends who had us over for dinner and to watch the movie. Much smaller group of people, much stronger community. Um, those were two radically different experiences of the Oppenheimer phenomenon. And as exciting as it was to like be in the theater, you know, and 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 see it when it was out, um, the the second experience of the movie was far more satisfying and and meaningful. Those are, those are two different definitions of community, though. I mean, I don't want to get married in a stadium with, like, 50,000 people watching me. <laughs> Ross wants unlike, Taylor, unlike too. Taylor and Travis. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> My prediction is she never marries. But can I just, can I just, like, I actually think there's a really important sports distinction here because I, I started out saying, like, I don't watch the Super Bowl, and I would, I don't want anyone to think that it's because I don't like sports. If you invite me to a live sporting event... Whatever it is, I will go with you. You know, I, I love, love, love the experience of being in a sports arena, watching a game. I love beer. I love hot dogs. <laughs> I love peanuts. I love cheering. I can't believe Lydia just pre-agreed to attend my neighborhood basement cockfighting clubs. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. You know. Lydia, I'm a season ticket holder. I'm, I'm a season ticket holder for Notre Dame uh, home games. So you're 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 okay, coming to I'm, South Bend with me. Seriously, I'll come with you. And and I just and I just want to say that like I think that there is something just very different from going to the movies. And I am not a fan of any sports team. I mean, I, I love the New York Liberty, the WNBA team, because I'm a lesbian and, you know, that's what we do. Um, <laughs> but, but you know, like, if you invite me to a sports game, I may know nothing about the rules. I'll know nothing about the, the, the teams. I'll have no allegiances. But I will bring all of my heart, all of my excitement, and I will, like, enjoy the hell out of it. You need to go minor league. You're, you strike me as more of a oh, yeah, minor yeah, no, league no. fan. Whether baseball or hockey. Lydia likes or... to do it live. I like to do it live. Yeah. Yes. The Hartford Yard Goats is a minor league baseball team that I have been meaning to go to one of their games. I'd, I'll meet you there for, for one. <laughs> um, so do we do we need more such events? Do you do we do we want more Super Bowls? We need some. I don't know how many is the right number, but I definitely would like more than, say, one. <laughs> and do they have to be huge like this? Have to be mass events? I think you do need a couple of mass events, but then I'm I'm all for the mini mass events. I'm okay with that. Mm, mm. Yeah, I mean, I think I think like multi level events is probably what what we need. But I think more than anything, like we need ways for us to come together around things that unite us that don't require us to disavow the things that that separate us, right? Or that we might disagree on. I think that, you know, we live in this like incredibly polarized and divisive times and agreeing to disagree, but enjoy something anyway, um, feels like just what the doctor ordered. That seems like a good place to end the game. To call a fair catch. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll blow the whistle, whatever you want to say. Um, but when we come back, uh, we are going to get hot or cold. Thank you. 
And finally, it is time for hot cold. Um, who is uh, sizzling or icy today? Oh, that would be me. This week, I have been hot on revisiting my favorite offerings from country music star Toby Keith who, after Aww. dealing with stomach cancer for the past few years, passed away Monday at the age of 62. So now, I know a lot of people don't like him. He wound up in this big feud with a band formerly known as the Dixie Chicks. But I've always preferred his daffier tunes. I'm a fan of the humor that runs through country music. That's what I find charming, and he had a real gift for it. I mean, especially kind of self-deprecating humor, which we could all use a little more of. So like songs like High Maintenance Woman, Red Solo Cup, I Love This Bar, or I Want to <laughs> Talk About Me. These were all hilarious. And my all-time favorite, As Good As I Once Was, which was an impressively upbeat spin on how much it sucks getting older, which I relate to increasingly well these days. So... I am wallowing in my Keith tunes this week. And, you know, I really thought it would have been a nice gesture to skip the chit-chat for this episode and just run his greatest hits for the whole time. But I mean, I if if you want to duet, I'm happy oh. if, if you to do <laughs> Beer for like My, my Horses dream. starting right right now. We'll raise up our glasses against evil forces singing. <laughs> Go for it, Michelle. No, no, no. Come on. I can't come even on. approach that Whiskey range. For... Okay. And beer for my horses. R.I.P. to a legend. Yeah. Not my favorite, but uh, I'll allow it. <laughs> Everybody's got their own thing. <laughs> no, I mean, I listen, I... I love I love mainstream country music. I'm not one of those like, you know, I listen to all country snobs, you know, love <laughs> love the real thing. Well, this this was ostensibly the Super Bowl episode, but like Taylor Swift, Toby Keith, Tracy Chapman, it's been I know. it's 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 been our 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 music episode. Music is what binds us, Carlos. It is. It is. All right. Talk yeah. about a mass cultural event. There you yeah. go. Especially when Ross sings. Because justice is the one thing you should always find. You've got to saddle up your bows. You've got to draw a hard go. line. All right. Lydia, I hope I hope you watch your first Super Bowl um, this, this, this weekend. Show. But if you don't, we won't judge you. Thank you. Um, I will, what, Ross what is definitely going to judge her. Judging her right don't you now. Make that I, for him? I, Ross's I mean, judgment I, is fuel for me. And and uh, all all I'll say here to to end is um is go go Niners. Go Niners. Go Niners. Oh, Carlos. Whoever they are, I wish them the very best. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. See you guys next week. Bye. Thanks for joining our conversation. If you liked it, be sure to follow Matter of Opinion on your favorite podcast app. And let us know what big questions we should think about next time by emailing us at matteropinion at nytimes.com. Matter of Opinion is produced by Sophia Alvarez-Boyd, Phoebe Lett, and Derek Arthur. It's edited by Jordana Hochman. Our ace fact check team is Kate Sinclair, Mary Marge Locker, and Michelle Harris. Original music by Isaac Jones, Efim Shapiro, Carol Sabaro, and Pat McCusker. Mixing by Pat McCusker. Audience strategy by Shannon Busta and Christina Samuluski. Our executive producer is Annie Rose Strasser. <laughs>